The 40 epidemiologists and public health scientists from all over the world who say they come from both the right and the left are making waves amid the pandemic. That's because they reject shutting down the economy to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. They're calling their position the Great Barrington Declaration. The doctors say, quote, current lockdown policies are producing devastating effects on short and long-term public health, including lower childhood vaccination rates, worsening cardiovascular disease outcomes, fewer cases cancer screenings and deteriorating mental health. Marnie Hughes spoke with two of the doctors and co-authors behind the Great Barrington Declaration. Dr. Jay Bhattacharya is an economist and professor of medicine at Stanford University. And Dr. Martin Kuldorf is a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital. Doctors, welcome. You have what is being called by critics a, quote, radically different approach to managing this pandemic. Can you explain your recommendation and also the science behind it? We have to do a better job protecting the old among us in nursing homes, people living at home, older people who are uh, about 60 are still in the workforce. While there's no public health reason to keep uh, schools closed from, uh, from in-person teaching, and young adults should uh, live their lives uh, near normally because for those groups, the collateral damage done by the lockdowns is much bigger than the risks they face from COVID-19. Well, and what you just said there, I think, will raise a lot of eyebrows because it is not part of the larger conversation that's happening. Okay, critics say your approach will result in more deaths and is downright dangerous by doing those things. Dr. Anthony Fauci has also called herd immunity total nonsense. There's a scientific mistake in the way our critics are thinking about herd immunity. The, the, there's only two ways at the end point of this epidemic. It's either zero COVID, which at this point is utterly impossible, or herd immunity. So there's no strategy uh, about herd immunity that, 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 that's unique to us. The current strategy is also a herd immunity strategy in that sense of, of essentially lockdowns until vaccines. The only question is how do we get to that end point in the safest possible way? with the least amount of death and the least amount of human misery. Instead, the doctors are recommending focused protection, which is another way to say herd immunity. They suggest schools and universities should open for in-person teaching. Extracurricular activities like sports should resume. Restaurants and businesses should open. And low-risk adults should work normally rather than from home. Critics, including the Director General of the World Health Organization, call this plan a dangerous approach and not an option, adding herd immunity is achieved by protecting people from the virus, not by exposing them to it. Never in the history of public health has herd immunity been used as a strategy for responding to an outbreak, let alone a pandemic. How many more people would have to die to reach that point? Well, it depends on the strategy we take. If we continue down this path of age-wide lockdowns, which is essentially the, 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 the path that Dr. Fauci is, is recommending, we will have many, many, many more deaths. Because what will happen is the older population will not be protected if we continue down this lockdown strategy. That's the issue. Both will lead to herd immunity. It's not a herd immunity strategy. That's a propaganda term. What will happen is at the end point of the epi epidemic is will be herd immunity. You have been accused of practicing, quote, Trumpian epidemiology. I'd like to get your reaction to that claim. I don't think there's any such thing as Trumpian epidemiology. There's just, uh, there's just epidemiology. And what we're, what we're proposing is actually a call to return to uh, traditional public health. Traditional public health involves thinking about people holistically, not just, uh, we shouldn't just be thinking about infection control and isolation. We should be thinking about health as a, as a whole. Uh, people need more than just to be not sick with COVID. They need, they need uh, 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 to be healthy in many, many other ways. And focus protection basically calls for a return to that. If, if that's trumping epidemiology, then so be it. But I, I don't think so. So, okay, let's say we send kids back to school. What does that setting look like? So Sweden was the only Western, major Western country who did not close the schools during the height of the pandemic this spring. So all daycare and schools were open for children ages 1 to 15. Uh, and there are 1.8 million children in this age group in Sweden. And of these, exactly zero died from COVID-19 during this time period. 
there were a few hospitalizations. But uh, so, so clearly it's safe for children to uh, go to school in person. So it's just to be clear actually. here, are you advocating that if kids were to go back on a large scale here in the United States, that they would not, under your recommendations, need to social distance or wear a mask? The key thing for children is to go back to in-person teaching. Uh, so that's, uh, that should be the priority, uh, whether, whether they were masked or not. Uh, one concern with masks is that for older people, uh, if they think that they're wearing a mask and other people wearing a mask, that, that, that gives safety for them to be out and about in crowded setting, that's very dangerous because uh, uh, they mask that is not going to prevent them from getting the disease. They need to uh, be physically distanced from, uh, uh, from other people and in crowded setting. That's how to protect the older people. It's true Sweden did impose lighter restrictions and kept schools open. But according to Reuters, the country also saw its highest daily rise in COVID cases earlier this month and registered more than 5,800 deaths, a per capita fatality rate several times higher than its Nordic neighbors. I'm curious, you both work at very prestigious institutions. What has been the reaction among your peers uh, with your report and your recommendations at this point in the pandemic? So among the infectious disease technologists that I have personal contacts with and uh, with I discuss things, not everybody, but the majority agrees with this focus protection approach. Uh, among other scientists who are not infectious disease technologists, I would say it's probably the reverse. Uh, most people believe in uh, lockdowns and contact tracing. How do you see a vaccine changing the course of this virus? If it was a safe and effective vaccine, it would be transformative. Uh, it would help focus protection. So it would make protecting the vulnerable much easier because we could prioritize them for the vaccine. And the jury's still out on when a vaccine will be available and how many people will feel comfortable taking it. But what percentage of the population will have to be vaccinated and for how long before the medical community, doctors like yourselves and the public as a whole feel that we have the upper hand on this pandemic? It really it depends on, on uh, what the vaccine looks like. If there's a lot of serious adverse events, then we have to think carefully about who's, who's best to get it. If it's uh, incompletely effective, then we have to, again, we have to think carefully about who should get it. Marnie Hughes, News Nation.